But what we're saying is instead of asking how does the brain make the mind, how does the cell make consciousness? How does a cell make sentience? And that's a different question. But it's one that can be answered. And it's one that has a damn good chance of being answered. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. In this episode, I'm beginning my investigation into the topic of consciousness with an interview. The field of consciousness research is broad and interdisciplinary with active researchers in philosophy, psychology, physics, neurobiology, computer science, and even theology. It's such a broad topic. We don't really know where it belongs because we don't know what consciousness is. We don't have good definitions for it. My first interview is a psychologist who wrote a book claiming that bacteria are sentient. Stay tuned for the interview. If you like what you hear, please press like on your podcast app, share it with your friends, uh, and send me a comment. Join my Facebook group at The Rational View, or come visit my website at www.therationalview.ca. I'd love to hear from you. Dr. Arthur Reber is an American cognitive psychologist, fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Association for Psychological Science, a Fulbright Fellow, and an avid curling fan. Known for introducing the concept of implicit learning and for using basic principles of evolutionary biology to show how implicit or unconscious cognitive functions differ in fundamental ways from those carried out consciously. His most recent work has been on the cellular basis of consciousness theory that maintains that all life is sentient, including even unicellular organisms. Dr. Reber, welcome to The Rational View. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much for, for accepting my invitation. Uh, I'm just getting into this topic of consciousness, and it's, it's such a diverse and broad uh, investigation. There are so many different theories of it. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm at, the, at the level of, of starting to learn at this point. So what I've, what I've found is that philosophers highlight <clears throat> what they call the hard problem of consciousness. But for me, the problem is that consciousness is ill-defined <laughs> as, as, a, as a topic. I, I don't think we are at the point of even asking the right questions about it. From your perspective, what is consciousness? <laughs> well, that's kind of an amusing question. Um, and it has no answer. Um, George Miller uh, said it best, I think. It, it is a sound worn smooth by a million tongues. Um, when you say the word consciousness, what invariably pops into people's minds is human consciousness. I, mean, I have consciousness. I'm conscious. I have, you, know, I'm, I, you look like me, uh, so I know I've got it. So I'll, I'll be generous and, and give it to you also. Um, but that's not the right way to do it. Because what that does is to focus your uh, investigations, whether they be philosophical or empirical, on human consciousness. And then you start scratching your head and saying, well, and it probably didn't just pop up here with us. So let's go, let's go look back through the, uh, the animal kingdom and look backward and, and keep looking for behaviors that suggest to us that this organism or this species is aware, uh, has mental states, uh, can solve problems, has memory, um, things that look familiar to us, sorts of things that we think about when we think about consciousness. And when we find them, we say, okay, that's good. So this animal has consciousness. Cats have consciousness. Birds have consciousness. Uh, well, some anyway, it depends on who you talk to. Um, but you keep pushing it back. And... Um, you come to some decision and then you, you go write a paper and submit it to a journal. While you're doing this, there's another group of researchers that are doing another little voyage of their own. These are the ones that do the cognitive neuro work. And instead of looking at human beings and saying, well, what is it that they do? 
that looks like it's conscious or um, an example of consciousness. What is it that's going on in the brain? What parts of the brain are handling these things? Frontal lobes, um, the cortex, so, uh, subcortical uh, uh, pathways and, and, uh, and centers. And you, you see if you can identify them, and they have. And, and, and there are a bunch of different ones that have to do with the sensory system, they have to do with the frontal lobes. And then you start going, you do, the, you do the same thing. You start going back through the evolutionary tree. But now instead of looking for behaviors, you're looking for analogs or homologs of those structures and pathways that we are pretty sure give us consciousness in human beings. And you do the same thing. You identify the ones that look like this is where it began. You say, okay. And you know what? They turn out to be pretty much the same ones that the people who are looking at behaviors have identified. Hmm. And so what you get hmm. are people who come to the conclusion that, uh, well, okay, it happened in the Cambrian. Because in the Cambrian, you got this huge explosion of multicellular species, and you got the emergence and development of a nervous system. And people think a nervous system is critical. So that's, that's the essential element that, that you often see identified. Hmm. Here's the problem with that work. <laughs> it's got an insurmountable crushing problem. It's called the emergentist's dilemma. You have to figure out why is it that in this species, at this point in geological time, suddenly consciousness comes exploding into, in, into reality when one cosmic moment earlier, it wasn't there. And every species before that one was just dumb as a rock. No awareness, no valence experience, no perception, no learning, no memory, no nothing. Mm -hmm. Just dumb as a rock. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Here's a principle of evolutionary biology. If something works, you don't give it up. You keep it. You use it as a core part of the genome of the species, and you build on it as a platform so that future species and clades that evolve from that one, whichever one it is, they will have that property, they will have that trait, they will have that function. So here's my idea. And by the way, this isn't new with me. Sure. Um, it's, it's new with cognitive neuroscientists, it's new with cognitive psychologists, but it's not new with cell biologists. Um, and um, the idea is just that simple. Life and consciousness are coterminous. Every living species has some form of consciousness and awareness valenced perception, good things, bad things. When they sense a good thing, they go toward it. When they sense a bad thing, they retreat and back away from it. And now you go back and take a look at, at um, unicellular uh, prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are the most, um, the simplest of organisms, the simplest of species. They have, um, their DNA is distributed uh, uh, at random throughout, throughout their, in the, the internal cell. Uh, they don't have an encapsulated uh, uh, nucleus like we, like we do, and like all uh, what are called eukaryotes do. Um, but they can do remarkable things. They learn. They learn. And they learn. <laughs> they learn things that are really surprising. Uh, for example, um, ABAB patterns. You would think that it would take a, 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 a nervous system to learn a pattern. It doesn't. And it was a brilliant series of experiments done by uh, Gerald Sewell at uh, University of California in San Diego. What they did is they fed their, the, the colony of bacteria uh, maltose. Well, they, they like it, and then they absorb it. They, they take it up. Okay. And then they follow that with uh, lactose. Okay. And they like that too, so they slurp that up. And then they gave them maltose again, and then they gave them lactose again. Maltose, lactose, maltose, lactose. And then they gave them lactose again. So it's M L M L M L L. That's the key. Okay. And they don't absorb the lactose effectively because they've already changed their biological their their their, their, their uh, uh, molecular functions, the biomolecular functions to maximally absorb maltose because they know that maltose is coming because they've learned the pattern. Now, that's, <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Um, it could be said that they adapt to the pattern, though, couldn't it? 
You know, why is consciousness involved in that? They're aware of it. See, here, here's the thing: you have you have to uh, shed. Oh, you, have, you have to get rid of this idea that we're talking about human consciousness. We're talking about the ur consciousness, the fundamental beginnings. This is where it starts. It starts because if a bacterium, a prokaryote, didn't have this kind of awareness, this kind of mental capacity, it would have been a Darwinian dead end. It could have never survived in the chaotic environment in which it, would, it first it first emerged. Yeah, I do. I definitely see that advantage of, of having an awareness and of being able to consciously adapt or consciously predict um, the future and adapt to that. That seems obviously uh, a beneficial thing that would be passed on through evolutionary means, as as you say, the first creature that could do this would would certainly flourish and, and pass this on and unlikely to be uh, lost but to, to say that you know single celled organism what, what what is consciousness in a single celled organism consist of is it don't really know I mean, is it just responding to to senses or tom 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 nagel uh, had, had a, uh, probably the single most researched paper in all of philosophy it was called, what's it like to be a bat? And the answer is, we don't know. But it is something. There is something it is like to be a bat. And I'm saying that there is something it is like to be a bacterium. I don't know. Look, I don't know what it's like to be Al Scott. I just know that there is something that it is like to be Al Scott. And I'm saying the same thing is true for a bacteria. And then I should try this one. Nobody, except a few fundamentalist Christians, has any trouble with the notion that life began once, it began as a unicellular species, and that all other species, extinct and extent, evolved from that single species. All I'm saying is that the same thing holds for consciousness, for sentience. If you don't like the word consciousness, by the way, you can use the word sentience. It's, it's a lot less um, um, uh, inflammatory. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't conjure up all sorts of you know things about sophisticated human functions. Um, in, in the book, The First Minds, um, I try to deal with this issue of, of terminology. Uh, <laughs> I'm also a lexicographer. I wrote the Dictionary of Psychology. Uh, Penguin Books published. Yeah, yeah. Went through four editions. So you should be good with definitions. Well, I am. Uh, <laughs> and, and what I did in this appendix was to point out how impossible it is to define the bloody term. It's just impossible. Um, and I go through the history of str the struggles of, of people trying to define it. And what I conclude is I'm going to use it as a folk psychology term. I'm going to use it the way in which an intelligent lay person who likes to talk about consciousness and experience and awareness and sentience would, would be using it. And the way in which they will trade these terms around, substitute them for each other, use, use them as uh, fairly recognizable synonyms. Um, and as long as they don't get caught up in, in, in Chalmers hard problem, they'll be okay. It, it, in his terms, it was, how does the brain make the mind? And by the way, you, you know what his answer was? He said, we'll never know. And he ended up as a dualist mm -hmm. because he didn't see any way that we could ever come to grips with the notion that mere stuff up here can make this magnificent awareness. This, this awareness thing is, is in another dimension, another domain. That's, that's, that's how you end up as a dualist. And that's not very helpful. But what we're saying is instead of asking how does the brain make the mind, how does the cell make consciousness? How does the cell make sentience? And that's a different question. But it's one that can be answered, and it's one that has a damn good chance of being answered. And in my collaboration for the, over the last several years with a cell biologist uh, by the name of František Malushka, it's a wonderful name, uh, he's at the uh, University of Bonn in Germany, and Bill Miller, was a medical researcher in Arizona. And what we've been doing is trying to identify 
uh, what the underlying uh, biomolecular um, functions, processes, uh, operations are that take place in an individual cell that gives rise to consciousness, cognition, awareness, uh, you know, whatever it is you want to call it. Um, and it's pretty clear it's got to do with uh, membranes, the cell membrane. And the reason the membrane is critical is because the membrane has to know um, what to let in. Nutrients, lactose, maltose, okay? Um, and what not to let in. Um, a toxic molecule, something that could cause, tis cause tissue damage. It also has to left, let, let stuff out, like waste products, from the met metabolism of the cell itself. So what we think is going on is um, it's sort of a biological metaphor for Maxwell's demons. Uh, do you know what Maxwell's demon is? Yes, yes. It's something that violates thermodynamics. <laughs> Maxwell's demon, um, uh, Clark Maxwell, uh, was a physicist, and um, he challenged one of the fundamental thermodynamic uh, laws. Second law of th thermodynamics, which states that uh, entropy always increases. And he said, well, now imagine we've got a box. And, and the box has two chambers in it. And I've, got, I, and I've got my little demon. My little demon sitting there. He's got a door. And every time it senses a fast-moving uh, uh, um, particle, it opens the door and lets it go through the, to the other to half the chamber. And it keeps the slow-moving ones in the chamber that they're currently in. Now, over time, what's going to happen is you're going to get an orderly arrangement where all of the fast-moving particles are in one chamber and all of the slow-moving particles are in another chamber. And so you have reversed entropy because you're not getting increases in randomness and chaos. You're getting order. And he thought that this showed that the second law of thermodynamics was false. Well, this went through a lot of debates and a lot of discussion. And the final analysis seems to be that um, Maxwell had a small error. He forgot the demon. <laughs> <laughs> the demon itself is doing things. The demon itself has to have energy input to it in order to carry out its duties. It has to be able to sense whether each particle is fast or slow. And it has to be able to open and close the door. Mm -hmm. Now, the second law of thermodynamics doesn't apply in an open system. It only applies in a closed system. And as long as you've got energy coming in, as long as a demon is doing things and processing information, it's an open system. And so the second law of thermodynamics doesn't apply. We think our demons, our biological Maxwell demons, are operating the same way. They don't violate the second law of thermodynamics because the operations in the cell, the opening and closing of uh, basically little holes <laughs> in, in, the, in the cell membrane, um, this, this requires information. It requires processing of information because uh, the cell membrane has to know whether something is good or bad, whether it's uh, a nutrient or whether it's toxic. It has to be able to sense whether temperature gradients are going up or going down. Uh, and so it has to be processing information and it has to be acting in a way that makes an impact on, on the biomolecular system. The tricky part is what we have is an anti-entropic uh, en entity, but we don't know how it operates. We, we, we just don't know. And um, my friend Frantisek says, there's just nothing that we know about biochemistry and biomolecular functions and biophysics that gives us a handle on how something like this can operate. He says we're going to need a new exotic physics. Um, and we might. Uh, I'm not crazy about using the <laughs> word exotic because it conjures up all sorts of notions of mysterious ideas and, you know, panpsychic things. Mm -hmm. the, the, the interesting thing about membranes that I've heard um, uh, in the context of, of um, consciousness or sentience, as it were, is the only, and this is a, a quote that I'm going to paraphrase, I think, um, the only thing we really know about consciousness is that it's soluble in chloroform. <laughs> That's absolutely true. And, and, and you know something? 
bacteria, prokaryotes, yes. they're sensitive to anesthetics also. You, you, you put a little drop in there, they go right to sleep. It wears off, they wake back up again. And it and that interacts through the membrane because of the lipids, right? Right, yes, yes. Now, why would a species be sensitive to anesthetics if it didn't experience pain? And the answer is it wouldn't. And that's why I'm saying this, this little critter would be a Darwinian dead end if it didn't have a primitive form of sentience. And then let me go back and make my other point. <laughs> it's just, just for the fun of it, because I've got to get this one in. And mm-hmm. the model's called CBC for cellular basis of consciousness. Okay. Now, my first thought was I could call it cellular basis okay. of sentience. That was CBS. But I'm not particularly fond of the CBS network in the United States. And so I gave <laughs> labeled it the CBC because of my fondness <laughs> for the Canadian broadcasting system. <laughs> well, well, thank you. <laughs> Canada appreciates it. Canada well, appreciates I mean, you do, do understand. Uh, I am the only member of my family who's not Canadian. My wife's a Canadian citizen. All of our children were born in Vancouver. And several of our grandchildren travel under Canadian passports. Wow. Nice. So that's, okay, so cellular basis of consciousness. This is, uh, this is, you know, basically the basis of your book. Um, I think there are, I mean, you've made some good points. I, I love looking at unicellular creatures under the microscope and seeing videos of these things moving around. They do look like they're moving with purpose uh, and, uh, you know, doing things that you just can't, it's very hard to explain that you would think you would need a brain to be able to do from um, a, from a, a classical experience. Right? Consciousness and brains are somewhat linked in, in creatures that do have brains and consciousness that we can investigate people. <laughs> you know, we can measure the activity in the brain and, and correlate it to conscious thinking and conscious uh, sensations and such, and, and we just don't even have that in signal cells. All sorts of things have happened that, that have changed things in fundamental and, and, and profound ways. Um, warm bloodedness, everything changed when that happened. Um, uh, 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 the the, uh, the eukaryote cell that has a- encapsulated DNA that changed everything. Um, being able to, to breathe oxygen changed everything. The first nervous system changed everything. But they're all building on the platform that's been there from the beginning. So you're, you're saying that this is um, a process that arises in a single cell that correlates to consciousness in some fashion. Uh, now, obviously, this it's, it's playing a little bit fast and loose saying this is a, a property of life because life is also an ill-defined concept uh, is it viruses uh, are they alive um, and then you go back to simple cells and, and scientists can make you know cells with metabolism in them in the lab with, with a petri dish with some <laughs> lipids and and some rna so are those things that scientists are making alive or are conscious um, they, they they don't reproduce they're, 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 they're not truly alive. There's, there's a whole um, um, field, a subfield within biology called uh, origins of life. And um, they struggle mightily mm-hmm. to try to figure out what the, what, the, what the original process was. It occurred over billions of years. It, it finally enabled uh, the first living species to, to, uh, to be formed. Bacteria form biomats, colonies collectives and they can get pretty large Mm -hmm. and um, when they do more a fairly common outcome is the cells in the center uh, undergo a a nutrient deficit because the nutrients are in the environment they're out there in the the water they're swimming around in and uh, it's not getting in and like I said they have uh, very rich perceptual systems. They know that they're starving and they're not happy. And so they will emit a molecule that travels outward that says, we're in trouble in here. The cells on the periphery will now reduce metabolic function and stop cell division. And that allows the nutrients to flow inward. 
and the cells in the, in the interior, they now get their food. They're now happy. They release a different molecule. This one is electrical. The first one was, 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 biochem was biological. This one's electrical. So it's a signal. It basically says, we're okay now. And the cells on the, on the periphery now begin normal biological functions. Do you know what this is? This is altruism. Because by reducing cell division and giving up consumption of nutrients, they're putting themselves in jeopardy. And they're doing it for their cell, their, their, their mat mates, as it were. This is, and I, I don't think that they, that they, they have experiences like we do, where we're, we feel we're doing the right thing for someone who's in trouble. Um, but this is the definition of altruism. And not only does this t kind of communication take place within a colony, it takes place between colonies. And if you have more than one colony in, the, in your Petri dish, and you do careful controls over where the nutrients are and how much each colony is getting, they will do the same thing. The colony that is in nutrient deficit will send out a message that goes through the the water through through the through the petri, petri, uh, petri dish, and the other colony will respond. Uh, the fellow who does this research says it's uh, it's time sharing because they're sharing the nutrients in a way that maximizes the survival of both colonies. And in the most recent research, they discovered they will do it across species. It doesn't even have to be within the same species, just as long as it's another living uh, uh, biofilm, another literally living biomat. Okay, I just thought you might like that one. And that's interesting. Um, obviously, it would have a, an evolutionary advantage to be able to do that as well. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe we should have some bacteria on the show to give us some, some lessons in morality. <laughs> I, 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 did, I did an interview with some ones which, uh, which contained a, a mythical uh, interview where I interview uh, a couple of bacteria <laughs> who uh, were not very nice about my doubting at first that they were sentient. By the way, I, I've given, and, and, and not just me, but my friends and my colleagues, uh, uh, Fred Ashek and Bill, we've all given talks like this to cell biologists, to cognitive neuroscientists, to psychologists, and to philosophers. And we always get the same reactions. So, cell biologists look at us and go, duh. <laughs> you didn't know that? <laughs> of course they're conscious. Cognitive neuroscientists and psychologists, um, they react like my son. Our son is a uh, cognitive neuroscientist uh, in the Department of Psychology at Northwestern. And he looks at me and scratches his head and uh, assumes a, a, a studied skepticism. <laughs> um, but um, he listens to me and he just doesn't agree with me. He, he thinks you need a nervous system to really have consciousness. Uh, if you talk to philosophers about this, We've learned if there's a philosopher of mine in the audience, duck, because their brains will explode as soon as you get your thesis out. Well, I mean, they, you must have uh, thought about the moral implications of sentient uh, bacteria and yeast. Wouldn't this imply that bread, yogurt, and alcohol are now non-vegan? I have a, sor a short section in the first minds on, uh, on ethical issues. And uh, in this next book, we're going to have a long chapter because there's some serious issues here. Uh, it's not just a matter of uh, uh, bacteria in yeast or in yogurt. It's also um, vegetarianism, veganism. There are a lot of people who, who, are, who are vegetarian and vegan for ethical reasons. Um, my friend Stephen Hart, Stephen Harnett, who was the editor, was the editor of Behavior and Brain Sciences, uh, Stephen's at University of Montreal. Uh, I've known him for decades. Uh, we're friends. And he said to me one day, he said, uh, I always knew he was he was a vegetarian, but he's now vegan. And he said, he said, I still feel guilty about the years where I was only a vegetarian. So it's for him, it's, a, it, it's ethical. Now, a lot of the ethics in his case has to do with uh, animal husbandry and the way they're treated. Um, and mm -hmm. being a vegetarian and a vegan is uh, his way of not contributing to that industry. But if pl 
plants are sentient. This, this, this is, uh, and it creates, I'm going to create some interesting issues with regard to vegetarians. Fradishek, uh, who, who eats anything, um, he laughed and said, well, they can just eat the plants that want to be eaten. <laughs> and there were a lot of those, because that's the way in which they get their, their seed distribution uh, uh, range expanded. Um, but it is an issue, and we'll, we'll confront it. But I, I would ask people to keep in mind every species, except those prokaryotes who are perfectly comfortable with sugars, every other species survives by killing and eating other living species, except a couple of them that hang around and wait for somebody else to do the deed and then they come in and feed. That, that's what we do mostly. Very few of us actually, you know, take our prey down. We, we, we let, we let the, 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 the industry do it for us. But we have to keep in mind that that's the nature of, of biology. Uh, that, that's, that's what you get when you get a carbon-based system. It, it's gonna, it can only survive by, by consuming other carbon-based systems. And so, yes, the ethical issues are there. There are a few people like Peter Singer who, who's tried to, to, to deal with some of these issues. He's a, an ethicist at Princeton. Um, and we will do our best to uh, to confront all of the issues as honestly and, and, and compassionately as we can. But it's 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 there. It's real. So let, let me ask maybe a, some some clarifying questions on your on your hypothesis. Um, the do you feel that uh, there are varying levels of sentience? Uh, you know, something with a brain has a different level of sentience than a single cell. Um, or, or, are all the, or are all the levels of sentience similar in some way in your, in your hypothesis? Well, as soon as you start getting multicellular uh, species, uh, things change. And one of the things that changes is the individual cells that make up the multicellular species still have their own sentience. But it gets channeled so that the uh, multicellular gestalt, as, as it were, has its own singular mental representation. And that takes place independent of the mosaic of sentient experiences that are taking place within the within the body. Now, you mentioned at the very beginning that my, my original research was on uh, unconscious cognitive processes, implicit learning, implicit memory. Um, and um, in my way of thinking, what that early work of mine was on were these cells. And, and let, let, let me take a quickie on implicit learning. Implicit learning is the capacity where an individual can pick up patterns, pick up relationships, pick up co-variations among elements in a display without knowing that it's happening. This is how a child, an infant, learns language. That they're not consciously trying to learn language, they're trying to communicate. And they're trying to understand what you have is an infant that's learning language. You have an infant that's becoming socialized. Um, and it, the same thing happens to you uh, when you go into a novel environment. You, 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 you pick up information that's there and you pick up patterns and structure and regularities without knowing that you're actually doing it. Um, and that's what's happening here. So over revolutionary time, all of these individual cells they were picking up information about the displays that they were in, about the context that they were living in. They're still functioning inside you. Your, your trillions and trillions of individual cells are functioning inside of you. And they're processing information that's giving rise to your visual experiences, your auditory experiences, your social experiences, your bodily movements, your muscular experiences, what your organs are doing. And all of that information is being processed and you're handling. And you're not aware of the learning. The learning is taking place unconsciously. Now, in these original experiments, they're, they're, they're baby experiments. We were just trying to make some fundamental points about cognitive functioning. But a typical experiment is you're sitting in front of a computer screen and there's six little boxes and they light up and you got six buttons. And when the leftmost button pops up, a, a light goes on, you, you press the leftmost button. And there's a pattern. 
and the lights go flash, 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 and you go press, 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 press. We build rules into the sequence, and you get faster and faster because you begin to anticipate what the next light is going to be. Now we change the pattern on you, and you slow down. Now we restore the pattern. You speed back up again. It's clear you know this. And then we stop and we ask you, and we say, okay, what's the pattern? And you go, duh, <laughs> no idea. We say, well, I will show you three of them. Tell us what the next one is. And we show you three. And you're a chance. But your fingers knew. And you, at an unconscious level, you knew that pattern, and you knew it was there. Yeah, muscle memory. It's, it's like muscle memory, but it's not really muscle memory. It's, it's a cognitive function. And after these ex this experiments were done, uh, uh, a dear friend, Jenny, Jenny Safran, who's at the University of Wisconsin, um, did this brilliant study. You take a three-month-old baby and lie in a crib, and you got on one side. Now, the first time you do it, the baby turns his head because they turn their head towards something that's new. And then you have these repeating. But you don't repeat just the same sound. You repeat a sequence that follows the rule. Now, the first couple of times you do it, he turns his head. And then after a while, it goes shrug. That's old stuff. I know that stuff now. So what do you do? You put in a set of phonemes that violates the rule. And bang, they turn their heads again. They learned the rule. They knew it. And this is new. Somebody just said something new. And now I have to turn my attention to it again. So even three-month-old babies are processing this. They're picking up this kind of information. It's all unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have much consciousness, at least not, not human consciousness, not yet. They're, they're, they're still three months old, um, but they learn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this study has been followed up by dozens and dozens of studies, very powerful effects. That, that uh, Amazing how sophisticated these kids are in terms of uh, picking up these patterns. So in my head, these, this, this new CBC theory fits ni nicely and neatly with my earlier work. In fact, it feels to me like it, 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 it brings full circle uh, the research that I started. Believe it or not, I started this, this first study uh, was done in, in 1962, the uh, first experiment on this. So it's now over 60 years. And in fact, uh, Rhiannon Allen, wow. <laughs> uh, Allen, who was upstairs uh, the, answering the, the robocalls when they come in, um, she and I just finished editing a, a major book for Oxford University Press. It is now being printed. It should be on bookshelves everywhere in a couple of months. And it's called The Cognitive Unconscious, the first half century. Very cool. And it has 19 chapters. Very cool. Uh, we each wrote uh, a chapter. And the other 17 were written by experts uh, in the field because these, this initial work that began in the 1960s on the cognitive unconscious has spread throughout the entire discipline of psychology. There isn't an area in psychology that hasn't been touched by it. There are chapters on, psych on, on, on psychotherapy. There's a chapter uh, on organizational psychology and how agencies operate and function. There's a chapter on belief systems and how they get formed. Uh, there's a chapter on, on implicit functions, unconscious, in, in the real world, uh, and so on and so forth. They're just so that's 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 fun, and, and that will that will be coming out soon. Very nice, good job. So I'm still trying to struggling to understand this and and, and learning uh, what you're presenting here. So uh, you're 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 basically saying that sentience emerges in the first cells. So this is you go through abiogenesis, and at some point you get uh, a reproducing cell, and and then sentience evolves into in these cells in some fashion something happens that allows sentience and then it takes off from there that's that's kind of your kind that's of the your, argument the root of your hypothesis okay in, in people our cells now are all sentient they they retain this evolutionary trait that makes them individually sentient 
but our brains in some higher level have an independent sentience that emerges from channeling of of sentience from cells. How does that process work in, in your theory? I, I, I would suggest, try, try this one. Something happens in the periphery um, that damages your, your tissues. The cells that are damaged experience pain. But because of the way in which we have evolved, that message that says basically, oh shit, I hurt, that gets translated into an electrical signal that travels along your neurons and gets to your brain. And it's processed there with the information about its origin, how much tissue damage there was, and the location of it. Now you're experiencing the pain. That's you experiencing the pain, your brain experiencing the pain, your uh, uh, collective consciousness experiencing the pain. But that, that little neuron out there, that, 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 neuron, that little cell out there where, where you, you, say, you, you cut your finger, that's where it began. And that cell felt pain. But because it's just a cell in your body, no one's going to hear it yell, except you, through this transduction function, through through the nervous system. Now, my, my friend Antonio Damasio, uh, who's a very prominent cognitive neuroscientist, um, uh, uh, Antonio doesn't like ICBC theory. Um, and, and what he doesn't like about it is that, uh, that, that final C, he doesn't like consciousness. The, the word for him, this is why I thought I was amusing that you, you started this, this uh, one hour discussion off with the question about what, what's consciousness. For Antonio, consciousness requires a nervous system. So he's perfectly comfortable with that description I just gave you about the representations of pain inside a human brain. He's also perfectly comfortable with a description of bacteria as species that can learn, have memories, communicate, and have expressions of feelings. He just doesn't want to call that consciousness. I said, if you want to call it sentience, are we okay? He said, yeah, we're okay. And one of the interesting things is Stephen Harnad that I mentioned to you, he, he's the editor of a new journal that he started. Uh, after he gave up the editorship of uh, behavioral and brain sciences, he started a new um, peer review, but it's an online journal. And it's called animal sentience. And I, that's the right term because it is neutral enough so that it doesn't set off these little, you know, brain uh, explosions uh, and uh, philosophers of mind. Uh, and by the way, they really do. I mean, I'm not, I, I, I spent a, a wonderful summer back in 1981. Uh, in a National Endowment for the Humanities sponsored um, uh, institute for the psychology and philosophy of mind. There were four psychologists and 40 philosophers. And boy, were we overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned a lot of philosophy. <laughs> and I became good friends mm -hmm. with a number of uh, then young and now quite prominent and highly respected philosophers. One of them is uh, Canadian uh, Paul Thagar um, mm -hmm. at Waterloo. Uh, and Paul, Paul's, Paul's brain just explodes when, when, when he contemplates, you know, my CBC theory. He just, yeah, I actually saw his uh, blog discussing your theory online, and he, he has some disagreement, points of disagreement that he lists. He, he offers a list of alternate hypotheses. <laughs> Uh, and, and claims that you have no evidence to distinguish between between panpsychism and uh, intelligence emerging or sentience emerging in cells versus panpsychism, which says everything in the universe is has sentience, including rocks and desks. And, you know, why do you make this arbitrary distinction at the cell level or, or at the brain level or at? <laughs> well, the, 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 um, 
the first chapter in the first minds is an extended argument against uh, uh, the, the possibility of a conscious AI and and an extended argument against panpsychism. Pan, panpsychism in, in the um, <laughs> in the words of John Searle doesn't even get up to the point of being false. Um, and it, it just doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. Uh, and in fact, Phil Goff is a philosopher who's one of the panpsychics. Um, he wrote a paper call. It was titled, Panpsychism Doesn't Make Any Sense, But It's Still Probably True. Um, I'm going with the first part, but not the second part. If you have a camera, and the camera's just sitting there, it's not conscious. Take a picture. Melt it on, on uh, 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 an EV. An electric vehicle, and link it into the uh, the uh, autopilot system. It's, it's now conscious, and it wasn't before. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's sensing and avoiding obstacles. It's got lots of sensing. It it acts like it's alive. It moves around pedestrians. Like I said, we we, we have a, I have a long a long chapter in the book uh, arguing against uh, um, artificial systems ever being ever being conscious. So the, the Searle argument that you quote is, is, is the, um, is, is the one where you can represent any computational system, uh, with, uh, objects, basically moving objects from one place to another. And so your, your argument is basically that, that, um, uh, seems outrageous to, for that to con conceive a mind from moving objects around, uh, in a grand, uh, very complex fashion in a computer. Is that, is that the, the, it's kind of an argument from incredulity that doesn't seem possible? Bi bi biological systems are analog. Computers are digital. Their, their whole computational platforms are, are completely uh, different uh, from each other. If you're ever going to get, you know, it's probably never wise to say never. Because if people can think of something, um, they, they, just, they just may be able to make it sometime down the road. So I'm not going to say that an artificial entity will never have sentience. But I will argue that it's going to have to be made out of biomolecular materials. And right now, nobody's doing that. Everybody's working with silicon and, quant and, and quantum mechanical systems, quantum, quantum computers. Uh, and, and they're not going to do it. They're, they're just not. It, 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 ain't, it ain't going to happen. But if someone figures out how, how to get the living cell in there, in the computational system, then that's possible. Uh, and we'll see. I, I, I'm, I'm in my 80s now. I don't think I'm going to be around to see it. So you're positing that there's a substrate dependence for intelligence, and it's got to be an analog, um, continuous system of processing rather than a digital simulation of something. Is, is that kind of the basis of, of that objection? You can simulate, but you won't emulate. Uh, as, again, as John Searle put it, uh, you, can, you can simulate all of the operations of, of a swimming pool. You know, H2O and, and chlorine, and <laughs> but, but you're not getting wet. It's a simulation. It'll run on a computer. Look, there are chess playing computers that are so good they can beat grandmasters. They can beat anybody in the world. There are now AIs that play poker better than the best pros in the world. And recently, um, an AI at uh, Carnegie Mellon um, consistently won against five top pros. And this is remarkable. The earlier AI, AI poker playing uh, um, um, uh, poker playing AIs could only win heads up against a single opponent. This one can beat five top pros because it uses what's called optimal game theory. And it doesn't know anything about poker. It doesn't even know what a card is. There's no knowing there at all. It's just a whole bunch of really fast digital operations and you know how you know how they this, this they, they, they got the AI how they built it it started out with a stupid AI and they put it up against another stupid AI 
and they gave it the rules of poker. And then they had to play a couple of trillion games against each other, trillion hands against each other. And every time it won, it increased the registry in the, in, in, in the hierarchy of the strategy that it used for that hand. And every time it lost, it lowered it. And over time, it modulated and it honed into optimum game theory, which is a, a mathematical theory. And once it had that, Mm -hmm. then it could be up to five pros. Once you get a full table, once you get eight other players or nine other players, the, the memory load exceeds its capacity to operate and function effectively. But that's just a matter of sheer raw digital power. And they'll, they'll have that one beat sometime in the near future, I have no, no doubt. But these AIs that, that play chess, they don't know anything about chess. They don't even know what chess is. <laughs> There's no knowing there. It's just doing they're very, they're very focused neural networks. They're they're focused on a, on a single problem, and they call they call it narrow artificial intelligence. It's not meant to be a general conversation thing that can pass a Turing test. But we're at the stage now where some of these more general um, AIs could pass a Turing test. You you could have a black box there and have a person and one and AI and the other, and they wouldn't necessarily be able to tell the difference by conversing with them. And so the question becomes that when you can't tell the difference between them, is there any there there? I mean, we, there's, you know, you go to philosophers like Daniel Dennett, who would say that this is all just an illusion, that consciousness doesn't exist at all. And it's, it's mainly a, a post hoc uh, narrator in our heads that it's trying to make up a, a convincing story that we have free will. Yeah, Dan's very clever. <laughs> I like Dan. We, 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 he, we, were, we were together in that, at that uh, uh, summer institute in 81, and we've been friends ever since. And when I wrote The First Minds, the long I, section I on Dennett, I sent it to him. I said, you're wrong, but have I got you right? He said, yes, you got me right. And you're wrong. <laughs> but that's okay. We've agreed to disagree. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Dan's, Dan's very clever. Uh, and um, I, 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 I mean, I just like him. I, I have a lot of respect, a lot of respect for him. Um, but he just can't bite the bullet. And, and here's, it, it goes back, you know who his dissertation advisor was? He got his doctorate at Oxford under Gilbert Ryle. Gilbert Ryle was a very sophisticated apologist for behaviorism. He gave the best philosophical defense of behaviorism that could possibly be given, because it's indefensible. But he did his best. And Dan has never been able to shuck his inner Gilbert Ryle. He's a behaviorist. Now, he talks cognitive, uses cognitive terms. He talks about consciousness. But he can't really let go of that notion that somehow he's linked to what is done, not so much what's what's thought. Um, anyway, that's that's that's. Well, as a scientist, as a physicist, I have some respect for for not going beyond the observations. <laughs> and and this is one of those fields where it's so subjective that it's hard to to put a stake in the sand and say something is here. In the first lines, I tried my best to be empirical. And I grounded all of my arguments about um, um, sentience in prokaryotes uh, on, on experiments, on what's known about what they can learn, how they set up memories, um, how they communicate with each other, uh, how they um, um, react. Um, and um, we will do the same thing with this next book. Um, French Schick and Bill are also strongly uh, empirical in their orientation. Um, our, our data are messier than your data. Uh, and the reason is because the problems that we're confronting are more complicated than yours. I mean, I know it's crazy to say this to a physicist, but the truth is, it is. Um, the social sciences, the biomolecular, no. biomedical sciences are more complex. Um, and um, what Frantisek argues, and I'm not completely convinced, but, but, but I'll, 
tell you what he says, which is that we're going to need a new physics if we're going to understand these underlying operations, processes, and mechanisms that take place at the biomolecular level. I have yet to uh, talk to the people who are um, looking at quantum minds, um, but that's on my list of things to do. There's a lot of um, physicists out there who believe that uh, quantum mechanics can produce a uh, coherent description of, of consciousness. Uh, Contact the, uh, the Organization for Consciousness Studies. Um, they've got some good, solid scientists, and they've got some <laughs> very flaky people. <laughs> uh, but I have little doubt that they will, you will be able to find someone who is in I'm going to be talking to David Pierce, actually, a uh, UK uh, philosopher who's got uh, a quantum mechanical theory. Well, we'll see what, what he has to say about the uh, superpositions of neurons uh, and quantum mechanical uh, wave function collapse. <clears throat> I think we're getting to the end of our time slot here, and it's been great chatting with you and learning about your theory. Uh, and uh, can you can you tell me again what what what's the name of the book that you're coming out with now? The, we're, we're, we're nowhere near coming out with it yet, but it will probably be called the Origins of Consciousness. Um, we don't even have a, a, a contract yet. It's just the prospectus is, is sitting with with the publisher. I'll I'll be looking forward to it then. The First Minds is, is out. It's been out for a little over two years now, um, and it's available through Oxford University Press. And um, it's a nice read. <laughs> and, and the new book on, on the, the cognitive unconscious, um, that'll be out soon. That's, that's a big one. It really is. Um, this is a major handbook bringing together a, a wide, huge, diverse field of, of research and study. Interesting. Um, I'll we'll be looking forward to that. So uh, before we sign off, I have a question I, I ask a lot of my contributors, uh, and I'll, I'll put it to you. Um, what's your favorite uh, science fiction? Do you, do you follow any sort of science fiction uh, stories or, or shows? Well, um, Childhood's End is always up there as one of the best. Uh, Asimov's Foundation series was terrific. And Doom. Love doing yes. well, I, I appreciate you coming on the show. It's uh, been, a, been a pleasure talking to you. I'm going to send you a, a Rational View t-shirt for coming on. Okay. Uh, you can uh, share that around. Uh, appreciate you talking to me. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my patron page at patron.podbean.com slash the rational view. Thanks for listening.